On today's episode of Tips from the Top Floor, we'll look into what it takes to get a good photo at some of Northern Ireland's more touristy places. And Steve has come across a bunch of expired film in a thrift store and wonders how that film should be treated to get the best results. This is Tips from the Top Floor, episode 839 for Thursday, September the 6th, 2018. Tips from the top, from the top floor, tips from the top floor. Hey, hello and welcome. It's Chris again, and uh, I've just returned. Well, I'm <laughs> I'm back home for two days before I go on the next trip. Uh, I've been to Ireland, as you know, and um, it was fun. It was great. It was wonderful. The photography was just perfect. The weather was very Irish, but it you know a bit of everything: sunshine, uh, some mist some clouds spotty light um and then we spent time in donegal in the northwest of ireland and this is the wildest part of ireland by far and the least touristy and uh, this is like the original ireland and then we um spent a couple of days over in northern ireland which is over on the west side of uh, the top of ireland and the difference between Donegal is striking because we went into, well, Game of Thrones country, which pretty much means that that uh, shooting locations where uh, some stuff for Game of Thrones was shot, and uh, they are using this for tourism purposes, of course. So there's uh, places like Ballantoy, which is uh, a harbor, a little harbor town that. Uh, some scenes were shot in and uh, tourists go there. Um, there is uh, stuff like the Dark Hedges, which we, of course, shot, which is it's an interesting thing. So Dark Hedges, if you don't know them, uh, check the... the I'll, I'll link something for you to have a look at. Um, Dark Hedges is, is, a, is an alleyway with... Um, is that the right word? Well, it's a it's a road with trees on the left and the right that lean into the road, and they are um, I think beech trees, and they are um, they look wonderful. They look beautiful from a certain point on that road. And uh, the problem is that, <laughs> that normally during daytime, it's kind of famous and it has been before Game of Thrones, but Game of Thrones shot some scenes there. I think it was the King's Way um, that the Dark Hedges were used for. And yeah, it has, it has attracted a lot of tourists. So there are buses with tourists stopping there to take a snapshot. Um, and... We decided, well, we, we, I wanted to go there, okay? So this is a photo, this is a photo that almost everyone has who was there, okay? So it's not like like I could reinvent this photo. Uh, the The variation is, of course, in the light, in the time of day, and in the, in the place I shoot it from, my perspective, and in the focal length. And, uh, and then in the post-processing, what do I do with it? So there is variation, but it's one of those photos that just, it's an iconic photo, and once you've seen that, you won't forget it. So I, I wanted that photo, and everyone on the in the group wanted wanted that photo. So we decided to go there around dawn in the early morning. It was still dark when we arrived, and uh, had everyone had tripods with them. It was dark enough to to have uh, to do like five to ten second exposures, and we had hoped for a sunrise for the sun to come in from the side, but it was overcast which in the end didn't really matter because it was still amazing light. There were uh, trees in the back that got lit from the sides, which yeah, just made for uh, a very beautiful picture. And of course, no other tourists, just us. We were early enough, um, which is one thing. I mean, I'm not a morning person. I'm a night owl. So <laughs> getting up at five in the morning, yeah, not my choice usually but in a group this is this is doable in a group and i'm so glad we did it because yeah it was just us there we had time to choose the right perspective we had time to to really work this shot to really make it work uh, we were there for probably an hour yeah which sounds funny if you want to take this one shot down an alley but 
We tried different places, we went forward and backward and sideways and tried to find the perfect spot from where you would get the coolest picture. And yeah, we were uh, lucky because we were there on our own. While we were shooting, there was a young couple that showed up and uh, they were... They were nice. They didn't run into our shots. Actually, we were nice too. We told them, "Okay, this." Well, they weren't. They weren't professional photographers. So, we told them, "Okay, if you stand here this and frame it like this, you'll get the best shot." And they were really happy about that. So, we did some uh, uh, tips for others <laughs> while being there. So, yeah, the dark hedges shot is uh, is. I'm I'm happy to say I have it. I have several. Um, I think my famous uh, my my fa- my favorite one is. A black and white version um, in landscape mode and so landscape orientation and it, it's yeah it's dark it's it's eerie it's nightish it has some light coming in in the back and yeah this is the one that kind of works for me works best for me I had a bit of a black and white thing anyway with the photos from Ireland because uh, I have been there several times and I thought I needed to mix it up and it turned out that that was a good idea. Um, so that was the Northern Irish part, the Dark Hedges. Also around the corner there is uh, Giant's Causeway, which, oh man, that is an exciting location. We're talking about, I don't know, tens of thousands of basalt columns, which make for an amazing sight. Um, but tourists, it is a bit of a touristy area. They want you to... Uh oh we we were we were upset with their parking fee structure because they want you to buy an audio guide or rent an audio guide and go to the museum that they've set up there and uh uh so if you are 10 people in a, in a, in a big car they want you to pay that 11 pounds and 50 10 times which is a bit of a BS move because uh, you don't have to pay to go to the to the Giants Causeway, but um, they they combine the parking fee with it's a mandatory parking fee, and later we we realized that we could have uh, per person right. Later we realized we could have just dropped everyone at the entrance, driving with one person in the car, and just pay the eleven fifty for parking, which would have been fine. Um, but anyway, we. <laughs> We managed to get around it, but and I, I'm all for helping, helping preserve these things and paying for it. But uh, that was just a bit over the top. Dear Northern Irish Tourist Board, uh, if anyone's listening, that's not okay. To just just for parking to have a car with ten people pay 115, uh, 100, 115 pounds. That just doesn't gel. Anyway, boom, right over. Um, so, yeah, this is the Giant's Causeway. These basalt columns, I uh, opted for a shot that did not have any tourists in it. Um, placed the tripod at the edge of them. Uh, so at the sea, it's kind of a split photo. Uh, I make, I'm making this the cover image of this episode. So if you want to have a look, uh, tfttf.com slash 839 uh, I'm not sure if your web, uh, if your if your podcast client shows it, but it's on the website. And again, uh, these basalt columns they are of volcanic origin. They are they are like hexagonal. Some are pentagonal, octagonal. Most of them are hexagonal, um, and they have order, right? It it looks like it was a deliberately ordered kind of thing, and. Then uh, there were there are other volcanic rocks in the photo that are more chaotic, and I did I managed to do one thing that I that I often do to a certain percentage to a certain extent, but not as much as this time. I'm very proud that this time I managed to do um, to do it to the to the T. And what I'm talking about is is the pre pre visualization. I knew up front when when I went there when I saw this with my own eyes. I instantly knew what kind of a photo I wanted to take. I pre-visualized the photo in my mind. It, I had the idea. I had the blueprint pretty much there. I planned it. And all I had to do is execute on the plan, on the idea. I often, often I only get, 
I don't know, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of what I strive for, which is pretty normal. I would say every photographer has a certain vision, but then the photo comes out slightly different, but in the general direction of that. Uh, but this time it totally worked out. So I decided to put both sides in one shot, the ordered basalt on the right hand side and the chaotic other rock on the other side and then the sea in the middle. Um, and because it was about the shape of things more than the colors, I made it black and white to kind of keep the distractions from the color out. And that worked really well. And it also um, is a very low shot. So I, I was very close to the foreground, which means that, yeah, it has a bit of a... Uh, it pulls you kind of into the picture. And when, the, when, I, when I had this picture, when I uh, saw it later in Lightroom... I was so happy because it, it turned out exactly the way I wanted it to be. So, yeah, very happy with that. But in general, I mean, both Donegal, which is in the Republic of Ireland, and Northern Ireland were both great. Um, but I, I love the way Donegal is just a little more wild. And they, they call the coast the Wild Atlantic Way um, because it's wild, because it is not as polished as some other things and i totally appreciate this makes for amazing photography makes for just it feels good um there are generally no fences most places uh you can walk up to cliffs and just <laughs> if you're not careful you'll fall down um but that makes yeah again makes for amazing photography um makes for a more common sense approach um there are also places that you can't even go without let's say asking a farmer if you could cross their fields like there is a sea arch that the marble arch that is not accessible without knowing the farmer whose land you have to cross to get there i mean the the the, the coast the the beach the the rocks and that stuff that is public but um but you have to cross someone's land to get there and our local con contact trevor is that man it's amazing how well trevor is connected and he's a great photographer himself, so he spends a lot of time scouting new locations. And he was just, again, as so many times before, the perfect man to 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 guide us, to get us to the places, to make sure uh, we we got access to these places. <laughs> he walks up to the farmer, says hi, shakes a hand, and then off we are. And anyway, I've uploaded a bunch of photos to my Flickr account. If you want to see them, flickr.com slash nubui. N-U-B-U-I. I'll link that in the show notes. Let me know what you think. Oh, and before I forget it, Trevor and I have uh, also talked about uh, coming back and doing a very special Ireland tour in 2020. Um, the, I don't know, we don't really have a title, but uh, pretty much the Wild Atlantic Way tour that uh, begins further south, down in Cork, uh, which is great to get to, easy to get to from pretty much anywhere. I think there are there are several direct flights from from many of the U.S. airports. So getting there is just getting on a plane and hopping out in Cork, and then we move up the West Coast. Um, the whole thing is, I think, ten day tour. Well, it's not really one hundred percent finished yet, but uh, we'll move up the West Coast through Galway all the way up to Donegal and uh, along the path. So the, the further up we go, the wilder it gets, which is just kind of an amazing arc for a workshop because you get uh, really cool stuff at the end but the, f the the beginning stuff is already amazing so this is like one superlative over the other which i just love to give people that experience it just makes everyone really happy so um we'll have plenty of amazing photo opportunities we'll do this in 2020 so it's not on the list for next year we'll take our time to prepare this really well uh and we've done some of the math on what lodging and meal, meals and transportation and the entrance fee and, uh, fees and stuff would come to. And don't quote me on this. I haven't really finished that yet. But to make this a 10-day tour, we can probably offer this at under 4,000 euros kind of as a total package. So all you have to do is get to Cork and then fly out of uh, Donegal Airport, which will, is just a quick hop over to Dublin and you can fly back from there. So it's really easy to get to, really easy to get away from, but yeah, it'll and it'll it'll be limited. We're I think we've talked about eight people max, so it's a small tour. It's a small group. It's 
um, eight people max and uh, a photographer friend of Trevor uh, will probably join us so that would make three instructors on a tour with eight people I think that's hard to beat so <laughs> uh, if you're interested send me mail and I'll put you on a like an early early access list as soon as we know more uh, email is chris at chris com. chris at c h r i s m a r q u a r d t dot com and I'll link that in the description <laughs> Hey, we have a new sponsor on the show. Let me welcome Vistaprint. Being prepared when an opportunity comes up is crucial and having a business card ready to go in your pocket is the first step to making something happen. With Vistaprint, you can create a truly professional, unique card in minutes, upload your own design, or start with one of their professionally designed options. Vistaprint offers simple tools and a wide range of templates to choose from. Then pick the paper stock, style, and quantity that's right for you. Choose your delivery speed and then order and receive your cards in as few as three days. Your next big opportunity is coming right up and for as little as $10 you can feel ready to make an impression with a custom card that you choose. With Vistaprint you can look and feel like a big deal whether you're a startup or a business with a century of history. Vistaprint wants you to do something great for your business right now which is why you the listeners will get 500 high quality custom business cards starting at $9.99. Use code TOPFLOOR at vistaprint.com that's Code top floor at vistaprint.com. Top floor at vistaprint.com. And I'd also like to thank another new sponsor, Honeybook. If you've ever started a creative business or you love anyone who has, you know it can be challenging and exhilarating all at once. One booking, one client, one referral, then another. That sweet sound of success. But what small business owner wants to spend their time on paperwork, endless emails and dealing with payment collection? That's why there is HoneyBook. HoneyBook is a purpose-built business management platform for creative small businesses. They help photographers, designers, event professionals and other solo printers save hundreds if not thousands of hours a year by adding time-saving automation into their business. HoneyBook makes it easy to streamline the client process so you never miss a thing. And that's why for a limited time, tips on the top floor listeners can get 50% off the first year of HoneyBook with promo code TOPFLOOR. HoneyBook membership includes unlimited access Access to all features at one low monthly price. So go to honeybook.com today and use promo code TOPFLOOR to get started. Again, that's honeybook.com, promo code TOPFLOOR. Hi, Chris. This is Steve from California. Uh, my question is regarding the old expired color film. What could you expect? from this film. Uh, recently I found in a thrift shop seven roll of uh, 800 ASA Kodak uh, film, color film, and, and expired in 2006. That's more than 12 years. And, and I have a nice old camera, the Retina 2, uh, made in uh, Germany. I, I think it's 1948. That was a year when when made this, and uh, it's, it's a very nice uh, compure shutter and and uh, f2 sharp lens and uh, nice. But uh, right now I just loaded up this film and and uh, use it half uh, from the 24 exposition. But but uh, I I want to know what can I adjust maybe it it needs some more lights or or what what can i expect uh, from this old uh, expired color film thank you very much bye bye thank you steve uh that's one of my favorite topics expired color film that is exciting uh, let me see. So the, yours expired in 2006. You found it in a thrift store and it's now it's 12 years over its date. And you asking the question, what should you adjust when shooting that film? Well, mm, let's do a little deep dive here. In general, expired film is hard to predict. You know, this is just a thing, especially color negative or, or color slide film. Uh, very hard to predict. I'll get into why that is in a second. But let's start with black and white film first, because, you know, black and white film, silver makes the picture. You expose that silver. Silver is a, spe a specific form. And the moment you expose it and then develop it, it turns black. And that's how you get the black in the black and white picture. 
And that silver is quite stable. It ages slowly and of course that depends on how the film has been stored. But in general, um, it ages slowly. Uh, storing, storing it in a cooler environment helps to slow down the aging of the film. So putting it in the fridge, that's why photographers used to and still do uh, put film in fridges. And some even freeze it, even though then you have to be careful thawing it up but or give it some time to do that. Uh, and if you don't sto store it in the fridge, then at least in a cool place that has somewhat stable temperatures. So having it up in the attic is probably a bad idea. Down in the basement, probably better as long as film the film is uh, thoroughly protected from high humidity, which basements sometimes have. Um, the one room that has proven to be great for storing stuff is the sleeping room of all places, because we kind of usually keep it quite stable in terms of temperature, and it also tends to be well aired. So, yeah, find a place in the, <laughs> in the cabinet somewhere in the sleeping room. It's probably a good idea. Um, and again, with black and white, I don't typically adjust much. I mean, if film is 10 years expired, when it's black and white, and it has been stored in, a stable, in stable conditions, I'll just shoot it exactly as before. Same timings and everything. But things change a bit when you look at color film, because... Um, in color, the relatively stable silver, I mean, the, it, the color film uses silver, but it's it's not used like in black and white film. Um, you, you use it... Okay, but so <laughs> here, quick primer on how, black, how color film works. Um, silver is in the film and it gets exposed and it makes the silver black. But then when you develop the film, there are organic colors, organic chemistry, color, color couplers, so-called color couplers. Um, and they're coupled to the silver. And where the silver turns black, the colors get released in several layers. And then the silver gets washed out during the development process. That's, by the way, called the bleaching step. So it gets bleached out. And if you look at a color negative, there's no silver left in the film. It's only organic chemistry that gives you the colors. And organic chemistry ages faster than the silver does. It's highly age-dependent. And what it makes what makes it even less predictable is the fact that color film, again, has multiple layers in different color components. Like it has a cyan, a magenta, a yellow layer, and those will most likely not age at the same rate. Uh, also, again, depends on how the film was kept. Uh, again, again, if it wasn't a fridge all the time, yeah, it's probably going to be more all right than if it wasn't. Um, was it in the attic with uh, regular strong temperature swings during winter and summer? Hmm. Or was it stored in the glove box of a car for years? That's probably, probably the worst. But uh, different layers age in different at different rage, uh, rates. Not rage, <laughs> rates. And as long as you don't know where the film has been for 12 years, you can't do much than try it out. Um, it is going to have color shifts for sure. I uh, I was lucky. I recently got uh, several hundreds of rolls of long expired color negative film, um, which was excellent because they all have been stored together under the same conditions. So I could just test test with a couple of rolls um, and see how it reacts and what the color shifts are. And from that, I could get an idea uh, how the rest would behave. And yeah, that's exactly what happened. The rest is in the same condition because it was produced in the same batch and it was stored the same way but of course if you only get like a handful of rolls from a thrift store that's not the best option so in the end you're down to surprise and uh honestly i often find the results to be really charming i mean uh, monica for example put a few examples of of expired film in our film photography handbook um I don't remember what film that was, but the film had lost like most of its red tones over the years, and the deep blue image that resulted was just really, really lovely. And in general, yes, you might want to adjust the exposure a bit because the the sensitivity, the overall sensitivity, will of course also change over time. Uh, but again, it really depends on how it was stored. As a rule of thumb, when it comes to exposure. I would say add about an additional stop of light for, let's say, every three years of ex expiration. But um, in practice, I haven't really gone beyond plus three stops. But with 12 years, a good starting point would be to set your light meter 
to an ISO that's three stops lower. So you said your film is uh, ISO 800. That would, let's uh, half that three times. So 800, 400, 200, 100. So set the light meter in the camera or if you use a handheld one, set it to ISO 100, measure, and then just expose um, to what the light meter tells you. That'll make sure it gets plenty of light. And then just enjoy the surprises you might get from expired film. And that was it for episode number 839 of Tips from the Top Floor. Thank you so much for being subscribed. And uh, of course, if you liked this episode, let me know by giving the show a rating on iTunes. Again, this is still the most important way for people to find new podcasts. And virtually every podcast client uses the iTunes directory. So by supporting the show on iTunes, you support it on pretty much every podcast client that's out there. Of course, you can support it any other way. There's Patreon, there's word of mouth, there's um, yeah, lots of different ways. Tips from the Top Floor depends on your support and every little helps. You find more at tipsfromthetopfloor.com or tfttf.com slash support. Thank you so much. You're an amazing bunch of great people. Thanks. Music for the show by Jeff Smith, Silent Partner, and Hence Better Cockroid Publishing and Slack Challenges by Release Pixie, Matt Rester, Armstead, Slack Invitations by Chief Invitation Officer, CIO Rusty Russ. And the link to get on the Slack and discuss with other tips on the top floor listeners is in the show notes. I remember that I told you My name is Chris Marquardt. You'll find me on social media, including Mastodon at Chris M A R Q U A R D T. I remember that. Go out and take amazing photos. Be nice to each other and happy shooting. <laughs>